My name is David Siddons and I'm president of the David Siddons Group and this is Jimmy Lee. He is a financial expert and dear friend and this is going to be a easy rift back and forth of us talking about the markets and me understanding the wider macro economy. So strap in, get ready for the 2022 Miami Real Estate Forecast and this is part three, understanding the macro economic cycle. So, Jimmy, thanks for doing this. I, we talked about this earlier, and I wasn't quite sure how to introduce you because you do so many things, and we have so many different varied conversations. But just for the audience, just present yourself how you think is best appropriate. First of all, David, thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I love your audience. I've seen many of your videos, and uh, it, they're brilliant and uh, obviously added value to a lot of the people that are out there. So thank you again for having me. Um, for me, I'm uh, 25 years in finance and uh, love my business to death. Uh, I, uh, my expert is more on the U.S. offshore and Latin American side. And what we do now is uh, my company, Tigris Investments, is we go out there and represent asset managers to distribute their products throughout the region through all the major banks, broker dealers, pension funds, and a lot of the institutions out there. So. For us, it's relatively easy because you know we've been doing this for the last you know 15 years in the region, so we have a lot of great relationships. But more than anything, it's just the love that we have for finance and what we're doing for this business. Fantastic. So let's dive into it. And I know it's kind of a, like a big question, but the macro market, what we're seeing in the market going on right now. I know what I'm seeing in the real estate market, and it's absolutely it's booming. But what are you seeing? What's your day to day looking like right now in this? you know, post-COVID world, and specifically as we're sitting in January 2022. Spectacular market. And, uh, you know, the the accommodations that are happening right now in this market with so much stimulus out there it will continue to drive this market forward and growth in general uh, through in all different sectors and different regions in, in the world. Um, I think that there's going to be a continued uh, growth in general. Um, I think there's a lot of liquidity out there that's going to continue to drive assets towards uh, or drive cash towards real assets, including stocks and bonds and real estate in your, in your side. Yep. But for me, it's, uh, you know, it's a really interesting time to be in, in the market right now because we are kind of in an inflection point with, uh, with where we are in growth. So you know, you're beginning to hear a little bit more and more about inflation. Uh, I think we're seeing it a little bit more as well and not only prices in goods, but also in uh, in gas, gasoline prices and yeah. food prices. Yeah, we talked about this earlier on. It, that yeah. crazy stories you're telling me about observing, like just getting hold of milk and food and cars and just everyday stuff that we never really thought of worrying about before. And all of a sudden, it's like it's become a thing. Yeah, I mean, being a U.S. person, and I know you're from uh, the U.K. as well, and, and you understand exactly how you know, uh, inflation works, but we never really had to see it firsthand. And yeah, I think the last, I don't remember the last time I started to pay real attention to inflation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just kind of got trucked along and it was like, oh, you know, 2%, 1.5%, uh, whatever. But now, I mean, like last month, uh, the records, I was reading something this morning, it was like 6.7%. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, someone's sitting on 2 million bucks that $2 million is going to lose nearly 7% in the next year at the current rate. So how do we, how, how, how does, how does, I mean, the government, how do they deal with that? How is that going to be dealt with? Because you're very close to that subject matter. Right, right. And that's where the Fed comes in, you know, so all central banks around the world right now are really beginning to think about removing the stimulus. Obviously with COVID and what happened over the last couple of years, there needs to be a stimulus out there to, to have the economy continue to grow. However, um, the key here is that if you have the economy grow too much, it ends up becoming a little bit more inflationary, which is happening right yeah. now, what we're seeing. Yeah. And that's what the Fed does not want. So the government itself, the Fed itself, is looking to reduce the amount of stimulus in order to kind of control that inflationary feel. So Latin America was a prime example of that, where you see inflation happening, you know, throughout the you know decades that have been out. You yeah, know. that was crazy. We saw some crazy, and, and that actually drove capital at us, particularly in South Florida, mm -hmm. because people are saying I, it was what we call the flight capital. Get my money out of the current currency, 
I saw it, my wife, you know, I'm sitting, we're here sitting in my house in the backyard and we're chatting here and it's very real and I've got a guy with a hedge trimmer off in the corner and <laughs> dogs on the other side of the house. But I remember, and with my wife being from Brazil, I watched their currency move from, I remember when we first met, it was like 1.5 to one and then two and then three. And now it's like knocking six to one. That's right. And then I saw other currencies even more. And as a result of that, we saw mass amounts of flight capital travel into the US and start buying up real estate at a crazy rate. But we're gonna to come to that in a, in, in a bit. We're not gonna to get to that bit yet because that's a really interesting area. So I don't wanna give away everything too soon. So you gotta keep watching. Um, <laughs> but as we're dealing with inflation here in the US right now and people sitting on cash, they're having to mobilize that liquidity. Otherwise they're gonna suffer, you know, the, the inflation aspects of it. That's right. How are you seeing it play out within within your markets, within stock market and everything that you're dealing with and the advice that you're giving? Yeah, I mean, if you look at real rates, real rates are negative right now. So if you're sitting in cash, it's not only just opportunity cost, but you're losing money. So a lot of times what we need to do is think about how to put that cash in motion in order to kind of take advantage of, you know, getting out of that negative rate environment. Yeah. And, and so a lot of things that, as I mentioned before, I mean, I think there's still a lot of movement uh, going into stocks and bonds uh, in general, even though uh, rates move against bond prices, I think people are still searching for yield. In my specialty, it's really about Latin America and Latin Americans are very much keen into income, just like the Americans are, but a lot more so in, in Latin America. Yeah. And, um, and so there's a search for yield. So you go back to what you were mentioning before about the currencies yeah. and you see a depreciation in currencies in addition to you know, um, a very uh, uh, tough environment in terms economically in some of these countries down in South America, in addition to lack of social um, kind of support systems that are down there, in addition to just uh, a general volatility because of, uh, you know, politics and, uh, and you know, the, the whole movement towards, you know, kind of the political side of, of the, you know, the socialism, the socialistic side. Now you're seeing a lot more money flowing this way because of safety. Even though taxes are a little bit lower down there in South America, they're still willing to take that chance and pay higher taxes here in the US only because they want to make sure that that money's safe. What's happening as well is you're beginning to see a lot of the pension funds because of COVID and other reasons as well. Pension funds are, being, uh, are allowing a lot of their clients or a lot of the, uh, the, the particip uh, participants to remove that money from pension fund money down there in South America because of, of stimulus purposes and getting people to use that money for, for uh, needs that they have on their own. Wow. But they're taking, a lot of the wealthy uh, investors down there are taking that money and bringing it here in the U.S. and going into investment centers like Miami. Which is, a, which is, a, which is going to come around into the conversation as we move forward of what they're going to do with it and how, they're gonna, how it's going to change our real estate environment. That's right. With the government, with the Fed, and looking at the rates and obviously controlling inflation because obviously we're at a, a, a new level that we're now paying attention to it. Um, we talked about the, the, the rates are gonna go up, the, the interest rates are gonna go up and obviously that's gonna affect mortgage rates and it's gonna affect, and we talked about how it's gonna affect the psychology or how it should affect the psychology of those who are buying right now because the rates have obviously been very, very low. And I think that sometimes people see rates go up and they go, oh, maybe I, maybe I shouldn't buy now because rates are kind of going to get hiked. But we're dealing with, I mean, obviously this year we're going to be dealing with rates moving up. And then I'm going to just add in, once you kind of go through that with me, I'm going to reflect on the effect on the investments on real estate and mm -hmm. the returns of that that we, we've seen in the last year. So take us through, what is the mechanism? How is that going to work? So maybe um, a better way to go through it instead of going through technically is just through an analogy. Yeah, you know, we all we have kids, love stories, right? Yeah, yeah. So we have kids, and uh, you know, and as you know, uh, maybe a first-time parent, you know, babies when they're in their crib and they're crying in the middle of the night, our instinct is to immediately go to the refrigerator and grab the bottle and start feeding the baby. Now, yeah. that feeding, uh, of course, is very nutritious for the baby. Uh, it's very necessary for the baby to get fat and, and to grow. But uh, the baby becomes very smart after a while and, and realizes that if he or she cries, the bottle will come out again. And so what the Fed is, the Fed is the parent. Um, the child is the market itself. 
and the milk itself is the stimulus that's being put into the market. Right. So a lot of times, what we do again, being comfortable and exhausted at night for the you know and after you know when when the baby needs feeding. We grab the baby and we feed the baby. And even though the baby is fat and growing and, and knows he or he or she doesn't need that nutrition anymore, he still keeps that bottle in his mouth for kind of uh, you know uh, uh, comfort comfort purposes. Yeah. And so now, as the Fed is beginning to remove that uh, that bottle out, because again the stimulus is they're going to start to reduce that stimulus in the market, is you're going to see that the market itself, which is the baby, will begin to cry and we'll see some volatility in the markets, yeah. but it's necessary in order for the baby to realize that there's not a, there's not a need for that, that milk anymore. You know, the six yeah. trillion dollars. No, it's, it's crazy growth that we've been under. And I was reading something this morning and it was an article that one of my, uh, one of the realtors I'm good friends with shared with me this article and it was a comment from Jamie Dimon and he was talking about that we're gonna have a booming year better than we've ever had before. We've had an incredible amount of growth and, and the economy is going to do well, but at the same time, it's going to suffer some volatility. That goes with the territory, and that's the crying, I guess, yes. that we're going to deal with, that we're going to see in front of us. And these, these increases in the rates that will affect our mortgage rates, you have to understand as, a, as, a, as an investor out there in the market or as a, a home buyer or an investor in the, in the stock market, you've got to appreciate that you can't predict all these things. There's going to be some hiccups that go along the road. This is how real these videos go. We have to deal <laughs> with car alarms now as a second part too. That's right. Yeah, and here we go. Car alarms I'm are gonna, great. I'm going to let that play out for a second. There we go. There you go. Thank you. Car go on. Um, so when we get back into this uh, volatility, there's fluctuations that will happen. It's okay. Don't freak out. Basically, don't lose the cool and start running for the hills and liquidating everything and thinking, you know, we're all going to hell in a handbasket. We have a very strong year, or what seems to be a very strong year ahead of us, as long as you don't go completely nuts and start, you know, day trading. That's right. Because that's a risky area, as we all to go into. You've got to be a bit more long term in the process. I've reflected on even with those interest rate hikes as we go up. We are dealing right now, and I'm going to make this relevant to Miami because I don't sell real estate in Seattle or, 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 or other cities. and It's more important what's going on in here. Right now, because we're dealing with mass migration still and we're dealing with a very large feeder state flow from New York and LA and, and San Francisco and all these other cities, um, the demand for our real estate is very, very high. Very high levels of demand, low levels of supply. And with that level of demand, it's not just demand for buying real estate and buying houses, but there's acclamations of people relocating who can't just jump straight into a house. So they're going into the rental market. And that has meant our rental market has absolutely exploded. So utilization of liquidity, of, of cash, to buy an investment property. And I don't necessarily mean running out and buying condos, which is what we typically saw with the South American mm -hmm. flight capital market that we experienced before with the devaluations of their currencies and buying in. We're talking about movement of, of capital within the US into Miami to use it in a growing market. And our market growing the way it is, the demand for real estate rentals is huge, so much so that we've seen stuff that previously might have rented for $8,000, $9,000 a month, suddenly rent for $20,000 a month. Hmm. We've seen short-term rentals go through the roof. Incredible. And so returns on investment have been obviously on the cap rate going from four or 5% to 10. And then appreciation of the actual asset itself, the value of the property going from say, 2 million to 3 million, uh, you know, very substantial increases that are so significant that uh, an increase in a mortgage rate pales in significance to that relative to it. We kind of got spoiled. I think we almost became the spoiled crying baby. That's right. And now we need a little bit of tough love. That's exactly correct. And that's the perfect analogy to it is, you know, you're going to see the Fed go out there and begin to uh, raise rates in March. Um, and it's been it's been kind of priced into the market already starting at 25 basis points in March, and then throughout the rest of the year, another 25 and another 25. So 75 basis points are predicted right now for the for 2022. But in addition, what they're doing is they're gonna reduce the amount of bond buying back, um, the bond buying program that they had. 
which was $120 billion of bonds that they were buying back every month to, to pump more liquidity back into the markets. So that's going to end as well in March. You know, so again, I think this has already been priced in the market. The market reacted to it very, very subtly and uh, they're expecting it. So the baby is just realizing as we're pulling that bottle out that they're saying, OK, we're full. I think it's OK for us to feel like this and, and we're OK. But again, I think it's, it's dependent on what's going to happen next year as well and how fast the Fed begins to ra raise rates. Um, what keeps me up at night, and maybe we can touch base a little yeah, bit on I want Yeah, I want to touch on, because we can go on about all the great things that are going on in our markets, because it's very easy to do that. It's a very, it's a kind of a, a lazy man's approach to just go, okay, let's talk about all the good stuff, because that's easy. That's right. Let's go to the staff. Like everybody wants to know, we want to protect our clients. We want to grow their wealth, but we want to protect them at the same time. What keeps you awake at night? Me yeah, this is um, it, it's a, it's a it's a broad question, and I think there's so many things that that'll keep me up at night. But one of the major things, and just you know, being part of the business that we're in right now in finance, is what keeps us up at night is a a policy mistake, you know. And and the Fed already has priced in three hikes this year. The market has already digested that. The 120 billion dollars of bond buying back that they're going to do, they're going to end in March as well, has already been priced in. You know, and, and again, here is the analogy and going back to what we were saying before about the baby is that, you know, sometimes we've got to read the baby cannot speak to us and doesn't understand, you know, uh, what we're saying to them and vice versa. And and is the crying, does that really mean that they really do need that milk for nutrition and for growth? Or is it that they're doing it because they're spoiled? You know, so the mistake that uh, the Fed could make or the central banks around the world could make is that if we pull it out too quick and the baby still needs that nutrition and that that milk to grow, we may not be, uh, they may not be doing it. Stunts is growth, right. So then there could be a lot more volatility in the markets if they do it too quickly yeah. and, and too drastically. So it's a really a fine line yeah. between what the Fed can do. Because we're dealing with human emotion here. We're dealing with the human behavior and the underpinning our markets, all markets, is the mass psychology of how people feel. If you scare the crowd, that's right. You you're gonna gonna suffer consequences, and so it's important not to scare the herd. And I think when we're talking, and we have a, you know, I'm very fortunate. We have a very big following. We have about a hundred thousand visitors a month to our site, and we have hundreds of thousands of downloads when we do reports. So I'm conscious that what I say is. There, there's a lot of variables that can happen. We're not omnipotent. We don't mm -hmm. profess to be omnipotent. There's a lot of things that can happen, but we have to be careful to not either be a overly bullish or overly bearish about what can happen because it's really very hard to, to see. But we do know that if you spook any market, it, it doesn't end well. Right. You've got to be careful. At the same way, you can't just follow markets blindly into the night as well because we see what happens when herd mentality takes over and you just follow the herd off into the off the cliff. That's right. Um, with some of the things that have been happening locally, and we talked about you know the labor effects and what's happening at work and so some of the things that are working in the day-to-day -day economy of Miami, some of the things that you're observing and seeing, because as we see new business coming in and we are seeing this growing, keep with a baby analogy, this growing developing child who is finding its way in this new uh, new century, and it is a new changing world order that we're dealing with, which is, there's so many things that apply now that never applied before. And I touched on this, I did a previous video. If you haven't seen it, Dana Bozovic, we're talking about Great you know, that market and how we've seen this new changing world order, the 21st century being discernibly different from the 20th century and from the 19th century. As we get into this new world change of people working in different ways and thinking in different ways and, and just their whole life, working differently. You're dealing with businessmen and women and corporations and, and observing these every day. What have you seen at a kind of a low, what are you seeing right now? I mean, I know you're in Miami, so you're seeing yeah. at a local level. But you know, it's it's happening nationwide. And I would, I would even say, you know, worldwide, you know, and you're seeing a labor shortage. It's interesting because um, statistically, if you look at it is, is the demographics uh, baby boomers um, are, are at the point of complete retirement. I mean, we're at the end of the baby boomers uh, kind of generation in terms of the workforce itself. What happened in COVID and, and the wealth effect that, that's been you know, happening for a lot of people 
is this growth of wealth has really given uh, a lot of people who are at the edge of retirement the ability to retire. Yeah. So remember, um, it's, a, it's a different economy now, a different type of mentality as well. The baby boomers have always been workhorses. You know, they've gone out there and really tr tremendously contributed to the economy in terms of working and, and all the past unemployment rates and everything that's been measured is always based on kind of that big generation of, of baby boomers. And as they're now retiring, we're moving into what we call, you know, the new gig economy. And a lot of these new um, kind of workers in, in, the, in, the, in the world right now are, are gig, um, you know, persons. And, and what they do is they go out there and they find their own way. It could be that they're working at a restaurant as a waiter or, you know, at the movie theater or whatever it is. But guess what? They're also doing something on the side as well. And if they find that the side business is going to do better, uh, in terms of their, you know, their involvement in some of the meme stocks like AMC or GameStop, and they're making money that way. Why do you want to work for ten dollars an hour? Yeah, why I mean, not? You know, you see it right now. It's very enticing. People go on Instagram, and and there's adverts for like, hey, twenty grand a month, thirty grand a month. That's right. Invest in this stock. Invest in crypto. Do this. Do this. And when you're making fifteen bucks an hour, and you've got a promise of making, you know, fifteen thousand. That's right. It's very, very <laughs> intriguing and very enticing people who, you know, human nature is people look for an easy option. And as we're talking about these different groups, and it's in the news, you'll always see articles about Baby Boomers doing this, Gen X is doing this, Gen Ys are doing this, the emergence of this group of people now entering into the real estate market. I, get, I see a lot of those articles, and they always make it into the news yep. because people want to know, okay, what's the next engine of the country going to do now? Because for a longest period of time, a lot of them were not buying real estate. They were like, we don't want to buy anything. We don't want to own anything. We, we don't want to own a car. We don't want to own, we want to, we want to Airbnb. We want to Uber everywhere. That's right. We don't want to own a house. We want to rent. And now obviously we're seeing a changing shift in that. I've observed two things really interestingly enough relative to real estate in the last six months relevant to the demographic groups that we're talking about. The baby boomers that you just mentioned. The baby boomers, and here's an interesting thing I've, I've realized. We have a huge amount of migration of people into Miami. And if you're a baby boomer and you're in Miami and you're watching this video, you're probably gonna start nodding your head. A lot <laughs> of them have said to me, David, I love the idea of selling my house at a massive profit. You know, they offer me double what I paid for it. But here's the thing, I'm not leaving town. So where am I going to move to? And if you then sell, let's say I have a house that I bought it for 5 million and now today I can sell it quickly for 10 million. If I sell that, it's a zero sum game because I'm then going to buy something else. Mm -hmm. But even if I buy something a little bit cheaper, now my taxes are going to go up. My property taxes are going to go up. And several of the clients I've been speaking to have said to me, David, I'm not thinking about you know, my taxes going up and not worrying about it because I'm making money. I'm thinking about I'm going into retirement as you said, That's I'm right. going into retirement <clears throat> and I'm now factoring in what I'm going to have to pay in property taxes and insurance to carry that house for the next 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, one of my friends who was a prominent attorney said, I could have like $2 million in the, on the sidelines to cover this. So I started to think how that's playing out into our psychology of our market and it's creating this standoff where people want to buy and people don't want to sell. That's right. And then we get into where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. You know, we, we've got a problem. We've got no product, we've got buyers, but we've got no sellers. So then we're starting to explore these other markets where people move into. And that can lead into, I mean, take us through, we're, you're seeing development everywhere. So maybe there's developments in other neighborhoods, other areas where people might migrate to as they move north into Vera Beach or Lighthouse Point or other areas. You're seeing some issues with employment on, on that side. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you, you have um, a friend of mine who owns restaurants here um, has mentioned to me recently that his whole family works every weekend. And this is including his kids and, and, and you know, really going out there and waiting tables and busing tables and washing dishes, everything, yeah. Yeah. because he can't find people. Now, again, COVID has a lot to do with it as well. And legitimately, you have COVID cases that are, that are booming because of Omicron yeah. and everything like that. So, you know, there are people who are actually sick and, and at home and, and really not able to work. But, you know, I think a lot of people are also using that as an excuse to stay home and possibly, you know, do some of the things we mentioned before where they're making money on the side as opposed to $10 an hour. 
So I think the problem I have, and again, maybe something else that keeps me up at night, not necessarily as much as a Fed policy mistake, but more that um, a lot of these restaurants and a lot of these, you know, the service, the service industry in general, it's harder and harder to go out there and find employees to kind of do your day-to-day -day business, to keep that business growing. Sustain the local economy. To That's keep right. that local economy running, and as the population grows and the areas grow, we look at urban, I look at the psychology of urban planning, and remember that, 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 car, that uh, video game SimCity is the growth right. of the city. You need new areas, you need new restaurants, you need new shops, you need new retail, you need new of the, the services and the things that people want. But if the employment with those services requires a certain level and people just don't want the jobs, how do you, how do you stimulate that level of, of need as areas grow. And again, it's going to be interesting to see which pockets through South Florida kind of develop and grow. Right. Because what we don't want to do, and I think we've seen this happen in other states, and it's one of the reasons why so many people are coming into us, is we've seen that demise through other, uh, other states. Decisions that have just caused restaurants to close and other businesses to close, to pack up and say, you know what, this ain't going to work. Right. And then they just they leave. Because and, 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 and maybe economically, it makes sense. You know, I mean, again, I think we've seen so many different bubbles in the past that have grown and, and burst um, because of, you know, whatever high asset prices that are, that are out there. It basically, if, if there is ever a need for kind of a pullback in the economy or the markets itself, it could be right now. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that it will happen or anytime soon because there's still a lot of stimulus that's happening. However, um, it's kind of the great equalizer, you know, if you want to, if you want to say that, yeah. because what, ha what ends up happening is that if the economy does pull back and the way somebody's been making money on the side kind of falls down in terms of the market investing in the stocks. Go, it's probably not a bad thing. It it's not a bad thing. Push them back into. Right. It's like with everything, fast money markets end badly. When you get people who are making quick money easily and it's not real, then ultimately you end up seeing sides of correction. I've seen it. That's right. I've tracked two economic cycles through Miami and I say two because people think, well, how come two? Don't we just have one? I mean, mm -hmm. wasn't it 08 and everything was great and fantastic? Actually wrong. I saw corrections in the condo market in Miami in 2015 and I wrote about this and I said, okay, if you have something here in these markets, you've got to get mm -hmm. out because I was seeing that there were people living beyond their means. That's right. And I think there are people who have created wealth recently that now can, at a point, as I said, a, a moment of inflection, they, that, that, that might go away. Mm -hmm. That might stop as things, as the, as the crazy boom stops. We've got great economic growth. I think there's just understanding, you're saying understand levels of the economy of what are growing legitimately mm -hmm. and what might be, you know, what you call that uh, black market side money that's being made. That's right. With business, like real big business, and I would love to, to hear your perspective because I've heard it from others. The growth, of, there's a lot of dialogue that's, that's come out that Miami is legitimately refining itself as a, you know, a, a, a kingpin um, city and state in the US as this economy moves forward into 2022. And outside of the other cities that are failing, we've got legitimate business tech is the, the buzzword that everyone's been going through. You deal with high pad businessmen and businesses and business women every day. Are you, what are you seeing? Exactly that. I mean, I'm saying I'm seeing a lot more movement this way. I mean, and it's not only the U.S. kind of immigration into Florida, you know, so from the, some of the states that, you know, you and Anna mentioned as well, you know, from yeah. California, from New York, from Chicago or from Illinois. Right. Yeah. Um, because of other reasons, but um, from South America as well. And we go back to that. And this is all coming full circle. And this is this is one of this is actually the bit that I got most intrigued. When we started talking, I got really intrigued because we were kind of throwing stuff back, back and forth. And we always had these great chats. But you then turned to me, and I've always had a big focus on the South American economies because I've, I've learned it since 2010. I saw Venezuela and Chile and Mexico and Brazil right. hugely coming in in 2012 and 13 and 14 and buying up real estate in Brickle and the urban core and Sunny Isles at an insane rate. And then um, obviously then I saw corrections in it and I saw that kind of drop off and I saw their currency movements and I saw the, the rise and the fall of the whole system. And in the last 20 months, my eyes have been just front and center with New York and, and California and Illinois and other areas. And I just haven't had bandwidth to think of anything else because my <laughs> phone blows up every five seconds for those. But you raised something 
with me that I was like, I didn't even see that coming. Mm -hmm. So take me through, I'm gonna, in your words, take me through through what you're seeing in the South American markets and how that affect, how you see that affecting up me and my business. Right, I mean, it's, uh, you know, again, the, the immigration this way of assets uh, is huge. Um, you have a combination of the political effect that's going on down in South America and all the different countries. Um, it's, it's really polarizing, as you, as you know. Yeah. Um, and it's really driving um, a lot of money away from those areas because of the nationalism that, that could happen. If you have a business down in South America, depending on which country it is, and your country is threatening to nationalize you know, the, a lot of the businesses, you know, you're going to take your money out and, and put it somewhere else that's a little bit safer that you can actually grow your assets as opposed to giving it to the government. Right. Um, there are advantages, of course, being down there as well locally is if you, you know, you're paying less taxes and all those. But but again, I think the movement of money has to be more on the protection of their assets. And so with lack of social programs down there and as I mentioned before, um, with COVID opening up a lot of the pension fund systems to allow the um, pension participants to withdraw their money tax free is if you're a wealthy person, why wouldn't you take all that money out and now put it into a, a U.S. offshore area where you're still money is still offshore, but protected in the U.S. kind of uh, jurisdiction, right? And so what we've seen over the last year, I mean, just take at the end of December of 2020, so that, that one year period from 2019 to 2020, just in asset management and, and mutual funds and ETFs, we went from $120 billion of, of assets to $160 billion in assets. I mean, we talked about you know a huge growth in money $40 during billion that time, just, boom, just right top. here. And in one year's time, moving money this way. So, you know, again, I think people are still interested in getting into an investments, uh, getting into real assets like stocks and bonds and through mutual funds and through asset management in general. But again, it just helps your business out as well because as they're yeah, moving money, because the money in, flows here, they want to keep it here, and they need to diversify. And then they diversify the and that diversification of portfolio is so important right now. That's and I right. Think, I think almost all my clients that I'm dealing with, and we're dealing with a very similar class of people, uh, highly educated, good amount of liquidity, very done very very well. They are conscious about diversifying their portfolio and protecting their wealth. That's right. Not just staying at the blackjack table and sticking it all on black and keep hoping that each time it comes up because otherwise, you know, eventually it won't. So with that in mind, that what what we expect to see, and I know that, and I can, I can kind of parry this into real estate, the South American economies have traditionally really, really plumbed for condos because it's easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have to look up. A house is great, but you have to look after it. There's a lot of moving parts. But with a condo, you can lock up and leave. So it's a little bit easier to deal with. And the attraction and the familiarity of condos is, is ever present if you're from Sao Paulo, Brazil, or if you're from Mexico City, or from other areas. Condo products is familiar to you. You understand it, you get it, it's, it, it feels right. Plus, you're in a, in a situation where you've got a growing economy and you can see the appetite um, for the product. And right now the appetite's been driven by the North American buyers, but what you're saying, if I'm hearing you clearly, is that there's a large appetite and a large bite that's gonna come from the South American economies as we move forward through this year. We're gonna start to see the emergence of that group buying into our market that has traditionally been on the sidelines, even though their currencies had been weak against the dollar. Mm -hmm. They are better mobilizing that liquidity and putting it over here because if it's over there, their systems are too fragile. Right. To and, protect and you know, it's it, history repeats itself, you yeah. know, and, and as we know, you know, Argentina, as an example, was a prime um, candidate for, um, you know, for huge losses for a lot of the a lot of the older generations that are out there. And they went through it, you know, not only with inflation, but just in general, repatriating and that assets. that baby boomer group, I mean, nothing, nothing hits home on a lesson as actually having lived through it. That's right. It's very abstract. It's when you're reading about it, you, things you haven't been through, and that happens with the younger generation now, you know. Not, nothing wrong with it. I mean, they're very smart, very, they're far more in it now than I think we ever were in our 20s. Right. They're engaged in it. But until you've been through it, you can't fully appreciate the pain that you feel when it happens. Well, that's it. The new generations have only heard of it, you know. So take Argentina again as that example is, you know, a few years back, um, Argentina gave a huge tax incentive to all of its citizens 
to say, bring your money back to Argentina if you invest into Argentinian bonds tax-free. I'm, I'm sorry, if you invest in, into Argentinian bonds, it will be tax-free. So any capital gains will be tax-free. So there was a huge incentive to repatriate that money back to Argentina. And those generations that did it, you know, learned from the previous ones and said, well, you know what, I'm going to do it only because if they find, and Argentina said, if we find money outside of, of, uh, of Argentina, we're going to tax you at a huge rate, something like 80%. I can't remember exactly what it is. So of course, everyone gave that, got that incentive to repatriate yeah. that money back. And of course, a few years later, a year later, um, huge depreciation of, of the currency, you know, bond uh, defaults were happening. And people, again, said, why did I do it? Yeah. So there's a trust they felt factor. They like they were lied to. That's they were exactly correct. Misdirected. And, and this goes back to what we were talking about before with the whole, you know, kind of nationalization of, of assets in general and, and the government really controlling and, and being, you know, I hate to say corrupt, but, you know, it's, well, it's very lack easy of a to term. distrust a lot of these governments right now because you see what they're doing. That's they it. They see what goes on in, in Brazil right now. That's so. right. Exactly. You know, so that's where I say is, you know, when you have that type of mistrust, you know, it just really gives a lot more, you know, kind of credibility to the U.S. Uh, market yeah. itself. Some of the investment centers, and I mentioned Miami is one of them. I mean, even from Mexico as, as well, you know, you've got a lot of polarization that's happening down there. Yeah. And you got Houston and, uh, and some of the Texas uh, cities that are really in San Diego and California. Uh, still attracting a lot of money that way as well. So, you know, again, but Miami is your, your major hub. Um, a few years back, I, I would say, let's call it, you know, 15 years back, New York was the major offshore hub of the U.S. Um, yeah, I don't now, think that's going to be the case anymore. It's 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 been like it's been Miami for at least 15 years now. You know, so you know, I think that if you're going to be somewhere, you really want to be here in Miami and take advantage of you know what's going on with asset levels here. And I think it's going to continue. I mean, I really do. I think a lot of liquidity is still out there, not only from a lot of people moving from the U.S. states to here, but again, as I mentioned before, with Latin Americans moving this way as well. Well, that, that wraps it up beautifully. <laughs> right, Jimmy, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. I always learn a whole bunch of stuff when we do these videos. My pleasure. And um, look, if you want more information, as always, see my information below, see my website. And Jimmy, in fact, if people want to find and follow you and understand you, how do we find you? Yeah, I mean, you can email me at jly at tigrisinvestments.com. Okay. And as I always say, if you want to be the smartest guy in the room, you better surround yourself by the smartest people. Okay. <laughs> One of the smartest you. people. Jimmy, thanks again. Thank you. Thank Get you so much. Get ready for David. our next video coming up soon.